Hello. Hi, Polly. No. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? You can't hear me, huh? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So let's see now. Did that work? Hit pause. Yay. Well done. All right. Sometimes I forget that recording. So I'm so happy that Laurel always has it. <laughs> Thanks, Laurel. All right. So welcome, kiters. Uh, women kiters from all over the world, we are so happy to see you and have you join us for our once a month collective chat. Um, this is just a, a way that we figured out we could gather together and meet fellow women kiters, especially during the pandemic. So instead of doing in-person events, we started these virtual um, chats and we've had all sorts of uh, speakers, um, both us on the board helping um, to educate or share information with you, as well as professional kiters and world champion kiters and kite surfers. So it's been really fun this last year listening to women kiters inspire and educate us. So if you're new to joining us, that's what we've been doing. And if you haven't already, like Laurel said, just rename yourself on the participant list uh, by hovering over your name and hitting more. And that lets us know where you're calling from. So thank you. Uh, today, uh, it is a board presentation or discussion uh, with myself. I'm the board president this year for Women's Kiteboarding Collective, and also Laurel Eastman, who was one of the founding members of this nonprofit organization uh, many moons ago. And uh, so today, we have decided to kind of kick off the new year uh, a little early with safety tips because, you know, every year whether it's work or personal goals, you know, there's always things that we're thinking about that we want to do newly or get better at. And so before this next year, uh, a couple of months away, we want to help you focus again on safety, or if you're a new kiter, to focus newly on safety because we want you to be safe and not sorry. Um, so Laurel Eastman um, has had a couple of decades of running a really busy kite school down in Cabarete, Dominican Republic. And uh, of course, we're thrilled that she's also on our board. Uh, so she brings a lot of experience. Um, I am uh, a kiter only for about the last five years. I actually learned kiting in my early 50s, believe it or not. And I went kicking and screaming into the sport when my new fiance decided that I needed to become a kiter along with him. So we'd have a sport and a passion to do together. And I got to tell you, I had a, co a really, really healthy fear of drowning. Yeah, because I almost drowned twice in my life. And mm -hmm. so when my fiance said, do you want to learn this extreme sport called kiteboarding? I, you know, kind of watched him a few times and said, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and eventually he got me into it a little by little by little. And finally, when I learned after about 23 hours of lessons, yeah, I was a slow learner. I wasn't a big athlete earlier in my life, so I didn't have any board skills. I was really good though at, at flying a kite. And so I remember my fiance saying to me, if you can fly a kite really well, you know, you're more than halfway there. So just keep learning the board skills and you'll put it all together, you'll be okay. So eventually I did. And I remember once, um, I remember not only my own near drowning experiences twice, um, once in Arlington, Texas in a swimming pool when I was younger um, and a second time in the Gulf of Mexico when I was snorkeling um, and I, I got caught in a riptide. And I remember, you know, thinking at the time when I got into kiteboarding, like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm going to put myself in another situation of potentially drowning. And that was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. Um, and I remember hearing about if I took the IKO instructor course, I would learn all things safety. And then I would be feel, feel comfortable. And at the time I did it, it was a stretch, but I did it. I became IKO instructor just like Laurel. And so we both teach um, at our own respective schools and locations. I'm down in South Padre Island, Texas. Uh, like I said, she's in Cabarete uh, and all over the world and uh, with her travels. But um, this helped me become what I call and many of my friends call me the safety queen. 
because I am all things safety. And so Laurel and I decided today was the day to share with you kind of our learnings about all things safety. So if you did the poll, thank you. That gives us just a quick idea. Um, a lot of you are saying that the top thing for safety based on this poll so far, if you've taken it, is choosing the right equipment for your kiting level and wind and water conditions. And another top contender I see is kiting with a buddy. So kind of like scuba diving, right? In scuba diving, if you've gotten certified, you know that uh, kiting with a buddy is a major principle of safety. And I believe that's true in kiting as well. Um, knowing the conditions and assessing the area before kiting has also become um, one of your top choices so far. Um, and looks like somebody said wearing a helmet, which of course, if you're uh, riding, jumping, doing tricks. That's super important. Um, and then good kite lessons. A couple of you said, yes, kite lessons are critical. Like I said, I did 23 hours of kite lessons um, until I felt really good about it. So Laurel and I, you know, based on our experience and talking to various women kiters, came up with three areas of safety for kiting that, that most of our tips would fall into. You know, riding and jumping, of course, but launching and landing before you get out on the water is where a lot of things go wrong, especially launching. And number three, the assessment of your site conditions and kite gear. Um, so with that, I'm gonna start. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of the more exciting things first, which is riding and jumping. And then we'll get down to number three, which is more about assessment and some of the pre stuff you do. So um, Laurel, if it's okay, I'll just start with riding uh, and jumping. And I wanna just give you um, ladies, an idea of where I saw things go really wrong. Um, when riding and jumping, of course, things can go very wrong. And this is where um, people that I've heard about, kiters, women and men alike, have had accidents, but also died. This is the most critical part when you're riding um, and something goes wrong and you can actually die from it, most of the time drowning. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Um, my stepson um, had a very bad experience a couple of years ago, which made me want to become an IKO certified instructor just to learn safety. So what happened is he was riding uh, on a foil with a kite. Um, he had connected his safety leash to the back of his harness, you know, on the little rubber line on the back. You know, some really good riders do this for tricks and so forth. They're very experienced. And, you know, some people think it's cool to connect it on the back of your harness. Not really, especially if you're not a pro. So he had connected a safety leash to the back of his harness. Um, something went wrong with the kite. I think it inverted. It got into what we call a kite mirror, right? Like the death, the death loop. And the kite started spinning out of control. And what happened is he got pinned between his kite foil and the kite, and he was backwards. So he's looking the opposite direction of the way his kite is going, and his foil is stuck between him and the direction the kite is pulling him. Now, what's really bad about this is he couldn't turn around. He's opposite of the kite. He couldn't turn around to unhook his safety leash. He was pinned with the foil and not even facing it. And his leash, of course, was on his back. Bad situation. So he got pulled underwater for minutes and every once in a while would come up, take a huge breath uh, and go back under. And he almost drowned. He got this close to drowning. And I remember when he was telling us about it, he said, when I took my third breath up over the water, I really did think this was it. This was my last breath. Now that was my stepson. So that's pretty close, right? In my circle, we, we, he almost died that day. And, you know, we learned that you know, connecting the kite leash to the front of your harness is really critical. Everybody should do that. Um, and Laurel's just put that in the uh, chat window. So we'll try to give you some tips as we tell these stories and examples. Um, and I'm sure you've seen some as well or heard about them as well. But never connect your safety leash to the back of your harness. You always want to have it in the front. Um, the other thing about your safety leash is I've seen people do this at the beach um, when I've been out there teaching and I, I notice other people and how they're getting all set up. Um, some people will connect their, their safety leash uh, upside down or backwards. So, you know, in other words, there's the little red uh, on, on a lot of them, the red, the little tube with the little hook and the little string, right? Uh, the little slip, slip string uh, that, you know, should be um, connected to your, your harness, right? Your safety. 
uh, release. Um, I've seen people connect the other side of that safety leash um, to their kite. In other words, the hard, um, what is it called? The carabiner, the, the hard metal piece connected to the safety um, or backwards, in other words. So if something goes wrong and you have to throw that secondary safety, if it's connected upside down or backwards, uh, it's too far of a reach to let the kite completely go. You know, so if you hit your first release and the kite's still rolling, it got into a death roll uh, and you go for that secondary release, if it's connected upside down, you, it's too far of a throw to even release and give you any throw or any room to let the kite calm down in the, in the wind. And that's something I've seen go very wrong. So that safety equipment of your leash, your primary and your secondary release, your quick release is super critical to check it, to recheck it. If you're new, to have someone experienced or a kite instructor check it, practice with it. I see people on the beach all the time that have been kiting 5, 10, 15 years that don't check their release, their quick release system. And you always have to check it. Um, so that's my first and number one tip. All right, so I'm gonna throw it to you, Laurel, and ask um, what have your experiences been around um, writing or any of your equipment? Oh, Holly, thank you. It's just a pleasure to um, yeah, share a little bit of wisdom, which uh, hopefully will lend to a lot of safe sessions for everyone out there. Um, so I will share a story from the very early days of kiting um, 22 years ago when one of um, the girls that was on the World Cup tour with myself and the KB for Girls um, founder, Christine Busa, who was also one of our speakers and has done an amazing job of helping women in kiteboarding. Um, so what happened in this um, accident was that they were um, riding in a heat and the two kites tangled. And so when the kites tangle, um, you know, we really recommend that you just hit that eject on your chicken loop and then just, you know, sort it out on the beach afterwards. Um, unfortunately, she did not hit the eject. There wasn't even an eject at that time. We were just hooked in with fixed lines. Um, and then sometimes people would use like these little snap shackle things with a pin that you would try to pull off. It was very dangerous in those days. And so the other rider, did release his loop and so his kite was completely free his leash was gone and his bar hit her lines and traveled all the way up to the top when his bar hit her kite both kites went into a death spiral and she got dragged into rocks she was upwind of rocks in the contest area and um she hit the rocks with her head and she died on the beach right there so that was like by far the worst accident that i've seen um in kiting and it may really made me almost want to quit <laughs> you know for about a week i was like this sport is too dangerous i am not going to do it anymore but then you know being young at that time in my early 20s i was like well it is dangerous but it's so fun so i'm going to keep going um so a few lessons there safety tip number three is when your kite tangle, when you are on the water, just go ahead and eject your primary eject, that's your chicken loop eject, and then have your um, hand on the safety for your leash as well. So be ready to eject in that case also. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's like a really, really good lesson um, just to, to, to be ready to, to let go. Yeah, so you would say safety lesson three is just to release, right? When your kites get tangled or they're out of control is to hit your safety release. Yeah, and one other tip that, um, you know, because obviously like you don't, in every session you're not gonna tangle <laughs> with somebody, but every session you are gonna land your kite. And so what I do is my personal practice and part of it is because of the equipment I use, you know, I'm mostly doing a surf style where I have like the harness line instead of the harness hook. So I attach to a line oh, and in order to do better. that, I have to open the um, chicken loop anyways. So as soon as I land my kite to my okay. assistant, in that moment, I, I eject my bar so that I'm training that muscle memory, just like I would train to like do a fun trick or something. So I, I really recommend that everybody, you know, even if you're not, even if you have just a hook and you're not using the line, go ahead and when you land your kite, just push that eject. It also keeps you safe in case something weird happens on the beach with your kite. Like maybe your assistant like gets knocked over by a dog who's running down the beach or maybe they like 
trip over a log that's on the beach and they let go of your kite. Like if you've already ejected, then you know that you're not gonna get pulled by that kite. Thanks, Laurel. So I'm just typing that in the um, safety tip number three in the chat window. So release your safety. If ever you get tangled with another kite or if anything goes wrong, always hit your, your primary release. Um, and then you've always got your secondary release, which is um, what, what I was talking about earlier that was upside down with the person I saw. Um, and if you ever land your kite and something goes wrong or you've got an assistant on the beach trying to land you and catch you, um, and maybe they're not very experienced and something goes wrong with the kite, you see it go back up and it, it feels like a gust of air or you know, just something goes wrong and there's cars or people around, just, just hit your primary release. Um, so it's just a good, a good tip if anything ever feels like it's going wrong. Um, don't try to save it. Um, I know there's been times out in the water that uh, I've seen people try to save, you know, save the kite, you know, don't hit that secondary release because the kite goes away from you. But I always tell people, you know what, if you ever have to hit your secondary release, uh, your quick release and get rid of the kite, you, know, you think about the value of the kite versus the value of your life. And once you say that to people, it's like, okay, you have a thousand dollar kite, maybe a two thousand dollar kite if you bought new gear. How much is your life worth? You know, how much do you actually get a life insurance policy? I, I bet if you bought one, it's at least a million. But most people's lives are worth more than that. So once you say that to people, they go, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, so if you have to get rid of your kite completely, uh, that's okay if you're in a bad situation. Um, and you know what? Laurel just said in the chat, safety tip four is practice ejecting your safety every time you land your kite. Now that's not, that's not something everybody does. Um, so get that muscle memory trained to eject um, every time you land your kite. I love it, Laurel. And you know what I actually do because I don't trust a lot of people landing, <laughs> catching my kite on the beach. Um, I don't know, I've just seen so many things go wrong, both landing and, and launching. So I tend to launch myself by doing a drift launch. So if, for example, you can, uh, the water's calm enough, the area works for you, there's not a lot of rocks, it's not a super windy day, um, learn really well how to drift launch yourself. Because most things go wrong with launching, not landing. Um, I've still seen some landing issues, but most of it's launching. So I've learned really, really well how to self-launch with a drift launch. And again, it depends on your location and how windy it is. Um, but landing, that's another thing. I come up on the beach and I see people there ready to land me. I'll just eject and do a, a basically a self-rescue um, and land myself. And that's just something that everyone should get comfortable doing, uh, launching and landing themselves. So thank you. Thanks for those tips. Um, Laurel on uh, launching and landing and um, when you get your strings caught with another rider which I actually had happen with my husband uh, when I'm out riding so to go back to riding for a minute I was in St. Lucia riding with my husband um, I took my eyes off of him for just a minute when we were coming up to both land our kites on a beach that we'd found our own cove where nobody else was um, kiting around St. Lucia's uh, coast. And we're like, oh, let's go to that beach. That's really cool. Let's just go check it out and, you know, park our kites and check out what's going on over there on that island. And he was already bringing his kite down to land it on the beach to do a self landing. And I came up too close to him and took my eyes off for just a minute. And my kite drifted down, got into his lines, got tangled. Um, and yeah, it was a mess. Luckily we were safe, but it took about an hour and a half to untangle those lines on the beach. And that was a real drag. So, all right. So let me just check in. Um, Laurel, anything to add there before we talk um, more about some of these other areas? Oh, um, yeah. So on launching and landing, obviously those are super critical times. Um, so, uh, you know, one of my top tips I would say is if the site allows and you you can and you have the space, it's really good to have your kite upwind and then run your bar and line downwind. Yes. So that way, two things can happen. First, you can lift yeah. up your back line and you can see that the back lines are attached to the outside of your kite and not the other way around because that is not good. You don't want that. And then when you're moving into your launching position, you're less likely to um, have the kite like power up unexpectedly. Um, you know, if your bar is upwind and your kite's like right in the center of the power zone. So if you tension the line, 
you could, you know, have the kite take off. So rig down winds, and then you want to just slowly move into position to where you're at that, you know, perpen um, uh, perpendicular angle to the wind direction, and then you can gently launch. I also like to always launch with my kite towards the sea. Um, you know, we say like, keep it low and go. Um, so that way you're not bringing your kite up to the zenith where it's unstable. And if a lull happens, the kite falls and then boom, catches. And then again, you lose your balance, you get dragged. So those would be my, my number, my, my top tips for launching safely. Oh, that's a good Laurel. And it just makes me remember, you know, one of the, I think the toughest things for newer kiters to learn is that exact thing you just mentioned is, you know, running your lines downwind when you set up your kite, making sure all the lines are connected at the right points of the kite uh, and aren't twisted. And that's going to be super important if you're uh, drift launching yourself out in the water, so you don't have to come back and fix those lines. But the other thing is that I, that you just made me think of Laurel is um, when you are trying to launch your kite and you have an assistant on the beach, um, a lot of times your assistants don't really know what they're doing. You know, maybe they're a newer kiter, but they're trying to help out. Um, and even some experienced kiters I've seen do this, believe it or not. Um, but the kiter who's got the kite and the assistant who's trying to help them launch, right? Who's, who's carrying the kite. They're both moving around trying to find that win window. And there's nothing worse than, you know, everybody's moving and they're trying to find, you know, where to catch the wind to launch properly. And I, I just, I'm surprised that, you know, ki experienced kiters don't realize the pilot or the kiter is the one that should start downwind and walk upwind until that wavy kite gets full of air, right? Till it's a perfect C shape. Um, that's when, you know, you've got the most air, the most wind to launch, but it's the pilot who's about to go out and kite that does the moving. So if you're ever out there and you've got an assistant ready to launch you, be sure to tell them, don't move. I'm gonna move. I'm gonna start downwind and I'm gonna move upwind myself with my bar until I find that sweet spot and I see the kite fill with air. And that seems really like common sense or basic, but I'm telling you, it's not. So be sure and let your assistants know, I'll be doing the moving, not you. All right. All right, so if you're with me on that, you get it, that's helpful. Give me a thumbs up, just a quick thumbs up. If you got it, you're with me, you're tracking, good tips, good reminders. All right, very good. Any other launching and landing uh, reminders that anyone wants to ask about or share? All right, well, we can open it up also for questions. Linda, did you have a question? Um, so, when you're talking about doing the um, self-release when you land the kite, usually here in Michigan, the way that people will do things is if there's a post, um, people will take an extra leash and wrap it around there. Usually you'll have like two or three posts that have like four or five leashes wrapped around them and they can even be a community leash, leash for anybody who's out there. But people will um, walk the kite still up in the air, attach to the spare leash, and then um, kind of lower the kite and then walk away from it uh, where you have it attached to the post and flip it over rather than pulling the self-release. Yeah, and that's exactly right. Um, to self-land, you know, ideally you would, if you're not in an emergency situation, use an anchor. Yeah. And so that could be like a post or like in Baja, you know, where they drive the kite beach or even in Texas where Holly is, you know, sometimes the car will be on the, on the beach. And, um, and then that's much safer, you bring it down, the kites just sit there as long as the wind is pretty steady. So that's exactly right. Um, when I was talking about pulling my eject every time, that's after my assistant has already grabbed my kite. So I have an assistant because, you know, in Cabarete, there's like kiters everywhere. So there's yeah. always someone to grab your kite. So every time I land, you know, I'm still in the water. I bring my kite down there at the shore they grab the kite, I immediately eject after they're holding the kite. Cool. Never occurred to me to do that before. That's a great tip. Yeah, a, it's just, a, it's oh, safe. Ahead. Yeah, no, Caitlin, please. I was also going to ask, so I've never self-launched or self-landed. So what's like the best resource to like get started? Is it like YouTube videos and then ask somebody to show you and practice or like, okay. <laughs> 
Caitlin lives in the Bay Area, um, so her local beach is Santa Cruz. Gigantic waves, not <laughs> ideal for self launching. Not the most now, friendly that's... crowd, actually. <laughs> everyone, in, everyone is super nice, but I would say at Santa Cruz at Waddell, they're a little bit less nice. But anyways, go ahead. <laughs> No, like you, this is really only for um, certain places. You made me laugh so hard. You shook me, you shook you out of my ears. Okay. Um, so you, yeah, the, the self-launching and landing is really only for certain locations. Um, so the oh. Bay Area, like, yeah. Um, okay. Don't no try. Kiting. I was for just you, thinking of like, you, <laughs> how do I yes. even get started doing it? It's kind of my question. Well, you, so. You probably go snow kiting with me and Fluffy, and then because in snow kiting we always self launch and land, okay. and we're in okay. like wide open spaces. All right, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah, <laughs> and on top of that, Caitlin, you know, if you have um, a, a kiter who's a certified instructor, just go get an hour with them. It's totally worth it um, to to hire a kite instructor for an hour to teach you safely, because there's nothing worse than you know getting a person out there who's been kiting for 10, 20 years and they think they know and say, hey, will you show me? And I can't tell you how many times I've, I've seen this happen where I've seen people, three different people train someone, you know, an amateur to train someone three different ways okay. to do something. And it's not yeah. really the IKO, you know, or the certified way. So yeah, get a, get an hour with a kite instructor on some of these practices. It really helps. Okay, thanks. Of course. And I just wanted to share with you really quickly um, a video of something that went really, really wrong um, while trying to launch a kite while we're on the topic. Can you see this, guys? Everybody? Yeah, watch this. All right, so did you see what went wrong? Who can tell me what went wrong? There's a couple of things in that uh, launch attempt. You could tell me one thing that went like a wrong. hot launch. It was a hot launch, and why is that? Because he was directly in the wind window. He was not, the kiter was not, the person with the kite was not standing in the right spot, I guess, to start. Right. Um, but I can't say I always have trouble like I know it when I see it and I know it when I feel it, but I can't say I know exactly where would have been a better place for every I guess for for the pilot to be um, more, it, it looks like the wind was cross on. And so for the for the pilot to even be more like on the land. Exactly. You're right, Carrie, you're right on. So they they should have been reversed. So so if if you if you think about safety, you always, if you can, based on your, your area um, where you're launching, you want to be launching towards the water, first of all, not towards the beach. Because if something goes wrong, that kiter gets launched like he did, a hot launch, um, he's going to come on to people, to rocks, which is why Laurel's example of the woman who died, right? She got thrown into rocks. Um, so if you're in a rocky area, but you could hit cars, you could hit people, you could hit rocks. So always try to launch towards the water, not the other way around. Um, and so like, I will always position myself on the beach. And if I have someone, at, I'll ask them to get a little bit in the water um, to help me. So um, yeah. So... Anyway, what else went wrong? There's something else that you mentioned. How did those conditions look? Yeah, he, I think his kite was too big. Yeah, his kite was too big. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah. All right. So um, we know from watching what went wrong. Um, and um, he also, by the way, didn't eject or let go of the bar, right? I think he actually pulled in a little bit with one hand because when, of course, when we're newer kiters too, that was probably a newer kiter, we want control. So we pull in and that's when things go badly. Uh, so side note, Holly, your nails look fabulous. Can you show us? Oh, thank you. 
speaking of your hands, so another thing that I do is that when I'm going into my launching, um, you know, like walking from downwind to upwind, getting that kite, as Holly said, to like fill, so it's not like flapping and filled, I actually keep my hands off of the bar for the most part. And then I'll just gently grab the bar to make sure like there's a little tension, but I'm not like death grip on the bar when I'm launching. Once I know I'm in that perfect position, then it's both hands on the bar and just gently steering it up. Oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that, Laurel. A lot of people don't know that, that you don't actually grab the bar until you know you're in the right position upwind to check the wind to see if it fills your kite and it's not flapping. Um, and the same thing on landing. As soon as someone lands you on the beach, you let go of the bar. I've seen accidents happen where people are still pulling on the bar and the person can't even properly grab their kite and turn it over into the upside down sea or smiley face, we call it. So let go of the bar as soon as someone grabs your kite. That's also a safety practice. And walk towards them. And walk towards you, them. You want you... the tension off the line. That's right. So then they can flip the kite or you can flip the kite to that upside down smiley face. Yeah. Hey, Good. can I ask a question? Sure. So on the launch then, are you, and you're not holding onto the bar, are you hooked in? Is it hooked onto the harness then? Yes, you're okay. completely hooked in. Yes, thank okay. you for asking. So all your safety gear is connected. You're connected to the kite. You just don't have control with your hands. Until you get into the wind window, then you can pick up the bar, check for that full air in the kite that it's filling it full. And then you can give the thumbs up for them to release and, and put your bar up to get it up in the air. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Good clarifications. Um, great. So another thing we want to talk about besides, um, you know, when I mentioned riding earlier and that riding can be very dangerous, um, it's not only um, crossing lines with people where you've always got to be, and by the way, really know your right of way um, on the water because there's some situations where people are playing chicken on the water, right? You've probably had that experience if you're experienced kiter where you're like, okay, wait, who's going to give here? Who has the right of way? So to always remember your right of way rules or to look them up if you don't know them. Um, and they can get confusing because there's a couple of you know scenarios where it's not always uh, a for sure thing. Um, but know your right of way rules on the water riding. Um, usually the one coming out with the kite has the right of way, but then you've also got, what is it, port side or whoever's got their right hand or their port side forward. Is that right, Laurel? Does that sound right? Um, I call it port, right, port side like a sailboat, right? So whoever's right front forward with their kite has the right of way. But if you're the one coming from the beach, you're the one just launching and getting on the water, you usually have the right of way. And people are supposed to yield to you. Incoming, coming in as well, people are supposed to yield to you uh, unless you see someone coming out and then you yield to them. So just oh, know- that's, that's a great one. Yeah. 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 Um, and then I saw Marge had her hand up. I just wanted to make sure that we didn't um, run out of time before we can answer her question. Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I am interested in the drift launch. Wait a minute. Ah, yeah. Um, the, I've tried a couple of different things and drift launch, but very often it's a failure. And what I've heard is to put the the drift, let go of the tight kite at a 90 degree angle from you um, and then just let it go. So that works sometimes if the wind is strong enough, but at other times um, I find my position is just wrong. So I'm looking for a tip on drift launching. Uh, what I do is, without getting to a lot of technical, because there are definitely some steps involved, but I, I always give it a little push, and the push helps get it in the right direction and to catch the wind once the lines get clear uh, and get pulled out. But Laurel, is there any other quick tip you can give on that? Well, I mean, I'm assuming that you've got a pretty, like, you're in a bay, you're not on the ocean, yes, so yes, it's like yes, flat yes, water yes. with yeah. a nice wind direction, it's like a cross on to your launching spot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't do a ton of drift launching. You know, I do it like I've done it like off of the boat and then at, just mostly on snow kiting, which is totally cheating because you just walk around. <laughs> you know, it's like very easy. Yeah. Um, so I don't have great tips for drift launching. Um, if anyone else does. I mean, my biggest tip that I learned is to push down a little bit on the kite and push it out. So a little push down, a little push out. 
um, gives it a little momentum to get out there for you. Um, that always works for me. Um, do you do the 90 degree angle thing? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yep. And if you want, I, I can post later on our Facebook page for the collective um, some tips on drift launching and maybe even a good video um, that I've sent a few people. Um, and, and I would highly recommend that you do, you ask an instructor to actually be out there with you to go over drift launching. Cause I've asked three people on the beach, how they drift launch. And I got three different answers and some of them are not safe. Like the whole thing about putting the kite over your head while you're throwing the lines out. Like what? a lot of people do that. Yeah. They put the, the leading edge over their head so they can see as they're throwing the lines out underneath the kite, not safe. Ooh. Not safe. Really I mean, if a gust came helpful. up, right, and you got the bridle caught around your head, so and those are experienced kiters. So, so do do get an instructor that sort of teaches you the IKO method or some certified method for drift launching, because people do it all differently, and it's just not the best. Yeah. Um, but thanks for bringing it up. It's an important skill I think to have that every kiter should have is knowing how to drift launch and also land yourself. Um, but I also believe kite with a buddy, if you ever can, I, I don't think it's safe to go out by yourself, no matter how good a kiter you are. I just don't. I believe you should always be with a buddy or at least know someone on the beach and, and they know you're out there because um, I've seen some things go wrong with individual kiters out and get way out there. They do say that you don't kite as far as you as you can't swim. So it's something to think about, like don't go further out than you can swim just in case something goes wrong your kite pops you know everything you don't have a flotation I mean, maybe you've got your imp hopefully you got your impact vest on but still you can get exhausted um, from swimming a long way even with your impact vest to keep you afloat thank you for that and yeah. i have to sign off unfortunately but i am grateful for your leadership thank you marge so thanks for being here all right take care bye everybody yep. The last thing we're going to talk about is um, if you are jumping or learning to jump or doing tricks, you know, front rolls, back rolls, et cetera, wear a helmet. Um, it really helps and always wear your impact vest. Um, it, some people think it's not cool to wear a helmet or an impact vest, but I, I promise you it, it's going to save your life in some situations. So I do recommend you do that. Um, the other thing is I wanted to mention is assessment site conditions and site and gear. Um, always do your assessment of what are the conditions, you know, that video you just saw that, that he should not have been launching there. And of course he didn't do it correctly. Um, but those wind conditions were really strong. He didn't have the right kite size. It was too big for a windy day. So know your combination of kite gear for the weather, the wind and, you know, the location you're at. Um, so knowing that, studying that, asking for tips on that from super experienced kiters or instructors, um, really assess, you know, are there rocks nearby? I don't, I don't know if you remember that video, there was not only a lot of waves and wind, but there were trees right by him. So he could have gotten launched into those trees. Um, so no, look all around, know exactly what's going on on this beach near this water and assess your kite gear based on that. And if you should even be kiting, um, there's some situations where if it's, you know, big gusts and squall coming in, bad weather coming in where the, the air, the wind is going to be up and down, you know, it could go from 20 to 30 in a gust and you're a newbie kiter, you probably don't want to kite in those conditions. Um, so just be aware of that. And also your kite gear. Um, kite gear is important. I know a kiter that's been kiting 15 years, a friend of ours, he is kiting with the oldest kite gear I have ever seen because he doesn't want to pay for the good stuff. And he tried to teach his wife on that kite gear and she struggled for two years because of the kite gear. And not only that, I don't think it was safe. So gear matters and update, updating your gear. I don't think anyone should be riding on gear that's more than three to five years old um, because all of the technology is being increased and improved every year with kite gear. So there's nothing wrong with buying used gear, but make sure it's at least, you know, not more than five years old. And I say even three, um, because all the equipment is updated, not just for helping you kite better, but for your safety. So really make an investment if you can in safe, good gear, especially harnesses. Harnesses and bars are really, really important. Yeah, anything to add there, Laurel? Yeah, you know, when we're doing our assessment, I think something really important to also always lead with even before like the externalities is like just having a really look inside yourself 
Um, because sometimes you might not be feeling up to it. Like, I don't know, maybe you just, you know, took a red eye to Cabaret. <laughs> you're like, oh, I just want to go. But then you're like, no, no, it's going to be windy for the whole trip. Like, it's okay. You can you know, just like, sit on the beach and chill and get a good night's sleep. Um, and also to really realize that, like, as you all progress through your wind sport, um, what may be like normal conditions, like super easy for you um, in one gear scenario might change. So when I was learning wing foiling last, um, last spring, I was like so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, why did I wait so long to do this? This is so fun. And it was like a super windy day with big ocean swell. And I was like, oh yeah, this is fine. Like I can go out, no problem. I've been doing this for years. <laughs> and my husband who's, you know, also highly trained outdoor professional had to like pull me aside and be like, hey, I do not think that this is the right condition for us to practice in. He's like, I am definitely not going out. It's like, if you want to go, but like, look at that shore pound. And it took me a little while. And luckily I had him there like talk sense to me. So just because, you know, you're comfortable, say with twin tipping, you know, if you're going to get started to get like riding waves or foils, whenever you like, Polly let us off with that very scary story of the foil going into the kite line bound to happen at one point, um, you know, really make sure that you are up for it um, with your skill level, your emotional state you're rested, you're hydrated, all that stuff. Laurel, I think that's so important because, you know, people sometimes like in South Padre Island, people come here for a week, you know, from the North or Midwest, and they're coming down to this, you know, amazing flat water, warm location to kite. And maybe they have four days to seven days. And so they feel stressed to get the kite again, no matter what they feel like or what the conditions are. And that's where I've seen some things go wrong as well. So your emotional state, your mental state, your physical state really does matter. I won't go out anymore if I'm not feeling it. And my husband gets so disappointed, but I tell him, hey, that's when I make mistakes. When I'm not feeling good, I make mistakes. And um, we all have to know what that is, right? Where that point is for each of us. So thanks for that reminder, Law. That's really good. Yeah, well, we've run a little long, but we wanted to talk about all three of these areas. Um, we told you 30 minutes. It's been about 45. So I just want to be respectful of your time. Are there any questions or comments uh, about anything we've talked about on safety so far? I just wanted to mention something. Please. Please, Kim. Yeah, um, uh, I've been kiteboarding more recently the past year. I live in uh, Florida and more so over in Sarasota. Um, I've taken a lot of lessons for safety. I love it. And um, I'm glad season's starting up. But um, the one thing that concerned me is because it's all shallow water, which is great, but then you go into some deep water. So, and there are plenty of people around. So as far as having buddies or whatever, but if you're kind of a little further out there, it's always concerned me uh, as far as getting into deeper water, or, you know, you've got your impact vest on. But if I somebody can't get to me right away, um, I was watching <laughs> um, on Shark Tank. Uh, it was about a couple of years ago, and they still have it. But they have a product because obviously a regular life vest is like you know to to hold you up in the water if you need to to kind of you have a hard time treading water after a while. They had this um, what they call wingman. It's one of the thinnest U.S. Coast Guard approved um, life vests. And you could literally wear it underneath your impact vest and probably take, and if you needed to, take your impact vest off and, you know, utilize it if you needed for flotation. So anyways, I thought I love that idea because um, it just gives me that sense of security. So just something throwing it out there. It's called the, the wingman jacket vest, but it's U.S. Coast Guard approved. It's very thin. You wouldn't even know it's there. And it's made for like water sports, even surfers or, um, you know, whatnot. But uh, let me see. This is kind of like a view of it. It's very thin. Awesome. So just great out there. Tip. Thanks, mm -hmm. Kim. That's a great tip. And uh, uh, Laurel just put in there the uh, link in the chat uh -huh. window. So if you'd like to go check that out for yourself. Um, that yeah, would be it's lovely. under hide. It's under um, hide. H-Y-D-E sportswear. Uh, it's $200, but well worth it, you know, for safety. Awesome. I'm going to check it out. I appreciate yeah, the Yeah, I intend to get one. Mm -hmm. the, other, the, other course, thing the other thing too is I have a line cutter that I'm going to, that I have it, but I have to put it on my jacket 
because yes. I went into a death spiral. Um, I was in Cocoa Beach and I had somebody with me, but um, I was just finishing. I was tired. I never even knew I went into it until the guy goes, oh, you did three, re- you did three loops in a death spiral. And I was in shallow water. I, I was able to get up and unhook real quickly, but that was quite the experience. Oh. Yeah, yeah, those are the experiences that make you realize that a line cutter is good to have. And yeah, of course, a definitely. lot of harnesses, a lot of the newer harnesses have a line cutter built into the usually the back, you know, that slip into a little pocket or somewhere on that um, harness. Yeah, maybe yeah. not all this of them, is, right? Yeah, I'm going to put right on my vest too. Yeah. Right on your vest where you can grab yeah. it more easily. That's important. Mm-hmm. I know another kiter down here in South Padre who ca- she's a very safe kiter. She carries a little um, shatterproof mirror. It's just a little rectangle oh, good idea a, she has a pocket in her vest and she keeps yeah. it there so if she gets in a situation she's always the last one kiting in the great idea in the sunset, right she can motion to a boat with the reflection of the mirror hmm. another thing that she taught me that i do now is i carry a whistle a marine whistle i wear oh. around my neck oh, and i yeah. tuck it into my harness so if i really get into trouble and nobody's near me it's a very high pitched whistle you can hear it for miles. Oh, love it. Those are little things. They don't cost yeah. much, but if you really want to be safe, do that. And remember I said don't kite um, further than you can swim. If you do get into deep water, which always makes me nervous too, Kim, I'm right with you. Uh, remember that fear of drowning. Yeah, so what I do is I always practice my um my safety um self rescue where I make the kite into a sail right? So if you haven't learned how to do that, it's a really important thing to learn to get your kite, to get the bridle, to actually rest on the side of your leading edge of the bladder and turn your kite into a sail to try to get back to shore if you can't swim it uh, or you're exhausted. So just remember that. And if you have to let your board go, let it go. So, you know, someone will find it later. Remember your life's way more important than the equipment you might let go of. So good tips. Thank you. Any other questions before we wrap up? I have have a question, but it might be well, too long of an answer. We'll see. I think one of the things I've gone to different areas in the Bay and with different conditions. And one of the things I'm still not quite sure about is like what size kite I need to have. And I think particularly because there's all types of kiters, skill level, and then also foilers out. So there's a huge number, like variety. Last time I was out there, there was a 13 and a half to a six. And then I'm like, I have, (laughs) so any, and also maybe just like, what's your, what's your strategy? If you're not sure, I mean, do you go under and then like, how do you figure out, do you figure that out on the beach? Do you figure it out in the water? So just, just some of the, some questions I have. Lol, you want to take yeah, that one? I will, because I know the Bay area, you know, I've kited in a lot of that, those spots. Um, and so it's tricky, right? Because if you ask a foiler and they're like, you're fine on the six. And then you're like, oh, I just want to be, you know, conservative, but then you're underpowered and you, you know, launch at third Avenue. And then all of a sudden you're like downwind, you can't get back because you don't have enough power because it's really hard to go up wind underpowered. Um, so yeah, you know, it would be good. And this is more, this is definitely like do as I say, not as I do. It's like really memorize, like, okay, if the wind speed is from say like, 12 knots to say like 17 knots, I'm going to use my 10 meter or 11 meter, you know, maybe something like that. And then if it's like above, like if it's, you know, 18 to 25, then I'm going to go down to my say like eight meter or whatever. Um, you know, so having that, I've never done that. I'm always like, even still two decades later, I'm like, what kind of should I use? <laughs> and then I'm like, wait, what board do I have? It was a lot easier when we were all just on twin tips. <laughs> but now that you're like, Sir, what board do you have? Oh, like, you know, there's all these variables. Um, So I would say my top tip would be to just really like dial in like for your board, your body size um, and the wind that you have, if you have access to like the wind meter on one of the websites. And then beyond that, you know, find someone who's more like similar to you um, or just confirm like, are you on a foil? (laughs) All right, add two, two sizes at least to your guide. Okay, thanks. Um, it's an important question. Thanks, Caitlin. And, and thanks, Laurel, for the tips. Um, do I always look for people similar to my size, like Laurel said, on the beach, 
And especially if they just come in and say, hey, what are you flying? How's the wind out there? Um, in fact, there's this hilarious uh, YouTube video out there on, you know, how many times people say that on the beach, right? It's all about, you know, what size you're flying. Um, so I'll see if I can post that on the Facebook group for y'all to watch. It's pretty funny. But learn from other people similar to your size. Uh, people just coming in from the water is a good, a good way to do it. And of course, the better you get at kiting, the more you can adjust your bar and your kite while you're flying, right? So um, I usually go a little overpowered just so, you know, if it's less windy than I think, I can adjust while I'm out there. Um, yeah, so that, so if you learn that with experience and time, you can adjust while you're on the water and not have to come back in uh, to, to re, you know, re-pump up a kite, which is always a pain. All right. Um, so learn your kite sizes and uh, adjustments on the water. I'm going to put that down there. Adjustments to your bar and kite while riding, because that, that becomes a really good skill to have. Awesome. Well, with that, ladies, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I really appreciate your engagement and your questions and comments. Safety, as you know, is such an important part of this extreme sport. Um, we have been doing these virtual chats all year long. And if you just joined us, we had some amazing speakers um, throughout the year. So just take a look um, at who all we've had, some kite champions and um, kite, I Kite Surf Magazine editor, the oldest kite surfer, female kite surfer in the world was our last guest last week or last month, Susan Frieder. Uh, we had our own board member, Francis, um, talk about kiting and kite foiling. Uh, which a lot of people are trying to learn now and winging. Um, so we've had some really cool speakers. We're going to have more speakers in the new year. We're actually going to just start planning that. So if you have any ideas of really great speakers you want to hear from, please email me at president at womenskiteboarding.org. I'd love to hear from you. Um, and we're going to go ahead and put some of these safety tips on the Facebook page, by the way, so you can see these later. Um, and today's Workday Wednesday. So if you have anything that you want to post, links, blogs, videos, any awesome work that you're creating or involved with, whether that be camps or kite gear or anything, Francis on our board handles that and she's going to post today if she hasn't already. Uh, just make sure you post in the comment section of her post and you can advertise or promote uh, your awesome things. Um, this is our board. We're here to support you. So if you have any other ideas on how we can do that better, let us know. We also are always looking for volunteers to help our mission. It's only up to four hours a month. Um, so let us know if you're interested and we'll send you some information or have a call with you. Um, and last but not least, I just want to remind you to support each other, encourage and celebrate one another through kiteboarding, all of us women around the world. Thanks for being here, everybody. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.